World War I, the Great War, was known as the War to End All War. It was so horrific, it was so widespread. That survivors believe no one will ever go to war again. They're wrong. Um, and so the war was called the War to End All War, and a lot of people refer to what happens afterwards. The peace to end all peace. In a nutshell, the peace of World War I is going to set the seeds for um, the rise of the National Social Socialists and World War II. What you're seeing here is a photograph of something called No Man's Land. Uh, this is the area between the trenches. This is the area between the Allied side and the Central Power side. Everything is destroyed. No life whatsoever. There's a famous painting called The Harvest of Battle. This is uh, as the war has come to an end. World War I comes to an end at the 11th hour of the 11th day of the 11th month in 1918. Now, an armistice was called a ceasefire, and then eventually people signed the paperwork, and that's it. So, this painting is of the survivors hobbling back home, crossing that no man's zone. Complete devastation. Nothing alive. Just these bodies dead in and around the water. Well, <clears throat> one of the participants of the war, a soldier, a British soldier, was a man named James R. R. Tolkien. Now, Tolkien, like so many young men, believed that war was an essential rite of passage. That war was honorable. War had rules to it. War was an opportunity to demonstrate and promote your courage, your patriotism, and your eventual manliness. Well, when men like Tolkien got involved in the war, they found that was completely irrational and untrue. War was horrific, it was brutal, but we had these new inventions. It wasn't just people fighting, it was it was tanks and it was planes dropping bombs. Um, it was chemical warfare, chlorine gas. It was blinding people or it, it would singe your lungs and you would suffocate. Horrific. Nothing honorable about this. So he starts sketching. Sketching what you see here. This no man zone with dead people all around and laying in and around the pools, and then this parade of wounded, the walking wounded going home. And he's sketching these images, what he sees, what he experienced, because when he goes home, he wants to write a book, uh, an allegory to war. A novel, a piece of fiction, and that talks about the evils of war, the evils of authoritarianism, the evils of modernity, of technology, you know, without actually whapping you over the head and saying, this is about World War I. But the books that he writes are about World War I. Like I said, they're an allegory, so he's a little bit more careful um, in how he writes to get the readers to think. Well, he actually puts out a series of books, relatively popular in the 1920s. They become wildly popular when uh, college students start reading them in the 1960s. Does this painting look familiar? No, it's the Dead Martians. That's from the second book, The Two Towers. J.R.R. Tolkien wrote the trilogy, The Lord of the Rings. The Lord of the Rings is once again an allegory about the evils of war, the evils of authoritarianism, the evils of when technology trumps humanity, and the evils of war. Well, we've already talked about James Reese Europe, very, very famous African American band leader before the war, and becomes very well known, very highly decorated infantrymen during the war. Well, war comes to an end, like I said, November 11th, 1918. And now what are we going to do? American troops come home. Well, we have two immediate issues, what they call the Red
red scare and the black scare. The red scare, 1919. There was a general strike in Seattle, mainly people striking for employer-provided health care. The strike became what we call a wildcat strike, meaning other industries are joining the strike, and hence the general strike. Well, many U.S. leaders declared this general strike in Seattle to be, quote, the first appearance of the Soviet in this country. Yeah, Americans will connect unionism, collective bargaining, with communism. Woodrow Wilson branded the Seattle strike, quote, a crime against civilization. Well, bombing campaigns increased in Seattle, Chicago, Boston, throughout the United States. These were bombs or bombing campaigns that were terrorist acts of the most radical of the socialists. Now there was, there was the Union, folks that belonged to Union, and then the socialists who were a little more liberal, they were a socialist after World War I called for things like universal health care and a minimum wage and other benefits. Uh, but then there were the, the, the violent socialists who believed that socialism should be forced upon everybody through violence. And so they engaged in terrorism, blowing up government buildings throughout the United States. Uh, Red's planned May Day murders was the headline of uh, American newspapers in 1919 and 1920. Well, these terrorists even bombed the house of the Attorney General, A. Mitchell Palmer. Well, a lot of Americans voted socialists into power, especially in places like Minnesota, Wisconsin, and Illinois. The mayor of Milwaukee was a socialist. Victor Berger of German descent was elected to the House of Representatives on the socialist ticket for Milwaukee. The House of Representatives, by the way, refused to allow him to be seated. So he goes home to Milwaukee where he wins re-election. The House still refuses to seat him. The uh, legislative branch in the state of New York expelled all socialist politicians who won state seats. States passed laws demanding that teachers take loyalty oaths. Oaths like California, that law is still on the book today. Teachers in California are required to pledge their allegiance to the state of California. Congress passes immigration laws that call for the immediate expulsion of any alien who even possessed written material considered to be socialist in nature. Then we have the Polaroids. A. Mitchell Palmer, the Attorney General of the United States, creates a new organization within the Attorney General's office. And they became known as the FBI. A young attorney is put in charge of the FBI. Anybody know his name? Kind of a famous guy. He'll leave the FBI until his death in the mid-70s. He was a transvestite. Never married. Worked with a male private secretary. All sorts of books written about his sexuality. Going to build his career in part by attacking homosexuals. J. Edgar Hoover. So J. Edgar Hoover leads these attacks, going to the headquarters offices and homes of, quote, known socialists, and just arresting people. They were denied bail. They were denied trial by jury. They were denied to speak on their behalf. They were even denied to have other people present evidence that they're innocent. Well, at least 550 people will be deported. Probably the most famous bombing is the bombing of Wall Street. Probably the most famous terrorist attack today in New York City is the 9-11 attacks. But before 
before the 9-11 attacks, when people in New York talked about terrorist attacks, they talked about the Wall Street bombing in 1919. Some communists, where is it? There we go. Some t communists took a vehicle, a truck, with a wagon on the back, and filled it full of explosives and things like nails. and set a clock to it, parked it right in front of the entrance to Wall Street and walked away and boom. This is, this is happening all over the country. So there are some major concerns that something's going on and people are demanding the government do something about it. Well, we also have the so-called black scare. African-American leaders told African-Americans, enlist, join the military, fight, be honorable, be patriotic, be courageous, come back. White people will see that. They'll give you your equality. They come back. It doesn't happen. What does happen is white people start lynching black people, especially those in uniform. Armed groups of white people and armed groups of black people roam the streets looking for each other. And there are some causes of that. One was migration. I didn't talk about this, but uh, we call it the Great Migration. There was a tremendous need for people to work in war industry during World War I, and we just didn't have enough workers up north, so uh, the workers were down south. A lot of labor, so it's primarily going to be African Americans and to a lesser extent Mexican Americans. Hundreds of thousands will migrate up north. They'll go to traditionally all white cities like Seattle. In San Francisco, and Milwaukee, and Chicago, and Cleveland, and Boston, etc., etc., etc. So during war, folks are going to you know, ignore the reality that all these black people are here because there's a necessity for these people. Just like after the after the Civil War, Americans will ignore the fact that a bunch of Chinese people are running around out west because the Chinese people are doing something that we want, i.e., building a railroad. They're transients. Idea is once the railroad is done, the Chinese people will go home. Well, the idea was, at least among the white Americans, that these black people are serving a need, and once that need is no longer needed, then they will go home. Well, we didn't go home. They stayed there. Well, because of our salary scale, black people would be paid less than white people. So business owners are going to keep the black people in these jobs because they pay them less than the white folks. Well, the white folks, the veterans who returned from Europe, are pretty super pissed off that they're losing their jobs to black people. Well, black soldiers are calling for social justice. They're calling for equality. White people say black people, by calling for things like equality, are just socialist or at worst communist. And there is going to be a tremendous amount of white versus black violence in which white mobs will go into either the black sections of towns or into African-American towns themselves, round everybody up, burn everything to the ground, and march them outside of the city. This happened in Tulsa, Oklahoma in 1921. Notice the caption that someone wrote. Running misspelled, running the Negro out of Tulsa. This area on fire, this was the black section of Tulsa. And then they're rounded up and they're simply escorted out of town. Well, during the war, Wilson had both long-term and short-term goals. Short term was coordination between or among himself, the British leaders and the French leaders, a communication uh, and a uh, what he called a Supreme War Council. Uh, it, was, it was basically political, you know, to ensure that the democratic values of the French, the British, and the Americans um, override all other issues. Uh, the long term was, of course, the 14 points. He issued the 14 points on January 18, 1918. So, that's, uh, what, about 
10 months after we, uh, uh, about eight months, uh, it's, uh, uh, within a year uh, after we declared war. And the 14 points address is the reason why we're going to war, the 14 things that Wilson wants to change. The realistic objective of the 14 points was to well, maintain the status quo, keep Germany and Russia off balance, and for self-determination. The idealistic objective of the 14 points was what he called new diplomacy, the creation of an organization of nations dedicated to maintaining peace. And that actually was the first thing on his agenda when he went to Paris. Well, here's what he called for. <coughs> Peace without victory, meaning we're not going to beat the hell out of the Germans. He called for self-determination, that there are peoples, ethnic, religious groups all over the world that are colonized, that are controlled by other powers, and that needs to come to an end. Um, people in Vietnam and Cambodia and Laos said, hooray! because the French invaded Vietnam and Cambodia and Laos in the 1880s and had attempted to colonize Southeast Asia. And so the Vietnamese believed, hey, Wilson's talking to me, get the French out of our backyard. The Arabs in Palestine are saying, hooray, now we've been controlled by the Turks and now the British are controlling us. Finally, we're going to get rid of these masters and we can be our own people. He called for open covenants openly arrived at. Trade. No secret treaties. Nothing that will stop trade or interfere in trade whatsoever. Open seas, no tariffs, no taxes. He called for a meeting in which nations were supposed to disarm. The reality is, he said, we don't need as many weapons as we have called for an end of colonialism, and that, quote, general association of nations, which will eventually call the League of Nations. Now, Article 10 of the League of Nations is the reason why the Congress will not accept the Treaty of Paris, the Treaty of Versailles, I'm sorry, the thing that ends World War I. Article 10 of the League of Nations stated that if one member of the League was attacked, that will be considered an attack against all members, and thus all members will come to the aid of the country being attacked. Now, Article 10 was drafted specifically to stop countries from invading. I mean, if you knew that if next time you invade France, if that meant that 20 countries came to France's aid, you may think twice about invading France. However, the Senate has a power, according to Article 1 of the Constitution, to declare war. And Article 10 of the League of Nations told senators that senators no longer have that power to declare war. Now, any time any you know, nut job European dictator invades somebody, now we have to go to war. And we don't want to put our war-making strategy in the hands of some foreign dictator. Well, World War I comes to an end in November of 1918. A few months before that, when Russia was involved in their own revolution, the U.S. invades Russia. Between 1918 and 1920, uh, the United States sends about 4,500 troops to join British troops and French troops and other European troops in what they called the White Army. Japan actually sends the most. They send about 70,000 troops. And here's a photograph of the U.S. Army with a U.S. flag walking down the streets of Vladivostok. Look at the date, August. This is three months before the end of the Civil War. So the Civil sorry, three months before the end of World War One. So we're still fighting World War One. World War One isn't over, and we've already launched our next war. We are entering the Russian Revolution. Well, the Europeans, the head of Germany, I'm sorry, the head of the French and the English, and even the Italians, did not care.
care for Wilson's idealistic goals. What they wanted is they wanted to carve up Europe, take their piece of it, you know, it's it their payment for the war, and then they wanted to beat the hell out of the Germans. They wanted to knock them down. There was something called the War Guilt Clause in which they forced Germany to sign. The War Guilt Clause said, we, Germany, started the war, and every problem, every death, every broken light bulb is our responsibility to repay. So, at the Treaty of Versailles, the Allied powers said that Germany owns about six million dollars in destruction to the Allies. By the time Germany paid off their World War I obligation, which was, man, I want to say 1998, 1999, uh, they, had, they, had, they had paid $33 billion. So next, Germany is occupied. The United States is occupying parts of Germany. So, we have, we're involved in a military intervention in the Russian Civil War. Uh, we have taken a section of Germany and we are militarily occupying it. Uh, Woodrow Wilson gets the Allies to create the League of Nations, which the U.S. refuses to join. Like I said, it was out of that idea of Article 10. There was a group called the Isolationists in Congress. They wanted nothing to do with any international treaty. They said, the lesson we should learn out of World War I is never to get involved in the world. It just doesn't end well. So what the Isolationists wanted is they wanted to pull up the drawbridge and just create Fortress America. Then there were the, the reservationists in Congress who said, well, they like the idea of the League of Nations, but not Article 10. If we can get rid of Article 10, we'll support it. Well, that didn't happen. 1922 was a presidential election, and Wilson runs around the country giving speeches on the significance of his 14 points address and the Treaty of Versailles, and particularly the League of Nations. Well, is Wilson to blame for this? Well, in part, he ignores Congress. He goes to Versailles, not with members of the Congress, but with his buddies, and he leads the U.S. delegation in negotiating a peace, which means if the peace fails, it's his problem, his failure. But Wilson is also out of touch. Look at this, Omaha, Nebraska, 1919. This is the result of the, uh, of the communist bombings and the black scare, the, the racial uh, tensions and violence in this country, so we got members of the Omaha National Guard with machine guns and howitzers. Well, what you saw in that photograph was what was happening all over um, the United States with National Guardsmen being brought out to protect life and liberty. Even in Washington, D.C., President Wilson had members of the Army there to protect the, the White House. Well, U.S. members of the military left Europe by traveling to Spain. From Spain, they came to the U.S. Fort Riley, Kansas, in March of 1918, an Army private reported to the camp hospital just before breakfast, complaining of a fever, sore throat, headache. He was quickly followed by another soldier with similar complaints. By noon, the camp's hospital had at least a hundred soldiers complaining of these problems, and by the end of the week, the number jumped to 500. Well, this spread. In army camps all over the United States are reporting soldiers reporting the same problems. In July, public health officials in Philadelphia issue a bulletin about what they were calling, quote, the Spanish flu. At the end of August, sailors stationed uh, on ships at the harbor of Boston began reporting to sickbay. By August 30th, 60 sailors were sick. Soon, the pier was overloaded with at least 100 cases, and so they'll be transferred from the naval ships to a naval hospital. 
people who have the Spanish flu report being feeling like they had, quote, been beaten all over with a club. In September, Dr. Victor Vaughn, acting Surgeon General of the Army, starts getting these reports that these soldiers from all over are having these same problems, and not just that, but now they're dying. Their faces turn blue, they cough up blood, and within a few hours they're dead. And there's so many dead that their bodies are being stacked like cordwood. At Fort Devens in Massachusetts, 63 men died one day of influenza. Harvard University in Cambridge, Massachusetts reports the first case of influenza. September 5th, the Massachusetts Department of Health issues alerts to newspapers and hospitals, warning of a growing epidemic. Quote, unless precautions are taken, disease will, in all probability will spread to the civilian population of the city. Well, the U.S. Surgeon General, Rupert Blue of the U.S., says, well, what you got to do is get plenty of rest, eat good food, take salt, and aspirin and you'll be fine. Well, these symptoms are now being reported by veterans in England, in France, in Germany, in Austria, in Italy, in England, in Ireland, in Russia, in Poland. They're all over the world. On September 28th, 200,000 ga gather for a uh, Liberty Loan Drive in Pennsylvania. The next day, after the big parade, 635 new cases of influenza are reported. And so the city closes all, quote, public amusements. Churches, schools, theaters, parks, everything is shut down. New York City announces uh, the danger is past. Quote, the city is in no danger of an epidemic. There's no need for our people to worry anymore. But hundreds are dying every day. Congress approves a special $1 million fund to create something called the U.S. Public Health Service, specifically to find a cure for this disease. They will rename themselves the Center for Disease Control. 851 New Yorkers die of influenza in a single day. The crime rate in Chicago drops by 43% because people are simply not leaving their house. They're either dead or they're too sick. In October, New York City tries to inoculate people. They're not sure if the vaccine can work. This is, you know, before rules, so people are getting paid. Celebrating the end of World War I in November, thousands of people from San Francisco come out from parades and everybody is wearing face masks. We see the same thing throughout the United States. By December, 5,000 new cases of flu are reported in San Francisco. 116,000 men will die fighting in World War I. 12 months later, 675,000 Americans will die of flu. Somewhere between 8 and 10 million people throughout the world died in World War I. Between 20 and 40 million people died worldwide of the flu. Between the deaths of World War I and the deaths of influenza, this country and this world lost an entire generation of people. There's this wonderful book published in the 1920s called The Lost Generation. 